I just wanted to let people know that um, we, d we did count out the seats to, for VIP seating, and, um, but it, at 5.02, when we're just about to start, I know some people had to park way in the north and they're still making a way, but at 5.02, if you wanna move up to an empty seat, you can, but let's wait until then, okay? Great, thanks.
Good afternoon. Can we believe that it's already Thursday on this incredible journey of ideas and talks? So I have the incredible responsibility today to introduce someone who needs no introduction, especially among this crowd. So John Wildering, as you know, is and has been in this island for many, many years. So just a quick raise of hand who has interacted over the last few years with him. <laughs> All right, so this is, uh, John, I, I, I have nothing to share other than perhaps two things. As a museum director, nothing warms me more and, than meeting a respected and, and a dear and eminence in our field. And again, the field of American art has in so many instances been marked by many of his publications, many of his contributions, and many of his works. But where I'm, my sweet spot is even deeper is, as he was the curator of uh, the National Gallery, when he, it was time to give a beautiful and a mass collection over many, many years, he gave it to a public institution, to the National Gallery. So again, as a museum director and as a colleague in the field, nothing warms me more than when something as prestigious as your collection that not only you amassed over the years but also interpreted was given to a public institution where now hundreds of thousands of people enjoy it every year. So that, that is amazing. Now, we were talking the other day about how he got into art history. And again, if I may reveal that, one of the things he's passionate about is sailing, as many of you know. But it was his, his knack about sailing as a young man that gave him also all the words and all the understanding of what a boat was. And so the riggings of boats and the intricacy of how a sailboat would work. And that gave him a particular eye into the work of Lane. And that is perhaps, I think, the work of his uh, PhD and then thereafter, a way of finessing his eye into everything he did. But it was that acumen of understanding of a boat, of a sailboat, and what a better place to now have a home, to enjoy sailing in the afternoons, and bring his passion for art. For those of you who have had the fortune to visit at his home, you know that he has many collections, and one of them at his home here is of Americana. But the most beautiful thing is how his desk is framing the water, how that inspires him. So please welcome an inspired author and an inspiring person from Maine to the podium. Thank you. jacket. <laughs> what Julian did not say <coughs> is that this occasion is a shameless promotion for the sale of the books. <laughs> so uh, I had great fun putting this together. These are a series of essays that I wrote uh, beginning in 2006. Uh, the last one was published in the journal uh, last December, and, we, and the book went to press um, uh, uh, the 1st of January. There, actually, I've, I've published a couple uh, since then. But this, this um, includes, I think, 25 images, uh, which I'm going to show you uh, in, I hope, a uh, quick sequence. But before talking about them, let me just say a word about uh, <coughs> the art pages of the journal and the feature of which this was a part. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's called Masterpiece. I don't remember the exact date, but I, my guess is somewhere in the early 2000s, Rupert Murdoch, uh, <coughs> uh, as you know, bought the, uh, the, the Washington, uh, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, at the time, I remember there was a lot of unease about whether this was gonna, gonna repress further arts coverage, uh, whether there would be any cultural cover, uh, coverage at all in the newspaper. Uh, at the same time, I recall the, um, uh, um, uh, the book section of the, of the Washington Post was closed down and integrated into the regular pages. Uh, and I think the same thing happened with the Chicago Tribune. So it was a, a sort of a nervous period. But what Murdoch did it was absolutely the opposite. He decided to create 
a new uh, weekend edition. It, had, it was a, up to then a five-day uh, paper. Uh, this would be a new weekend edition, and one whole section out of, there are four sections called the review sections and de devoted entirely to the arts. And I, uh, I had read it over the years. I think today it's uh, the best arts coverage, certainly far more interesting and appealing than the New York Times. Uh, it has a combination, uh, obviously, of, of really interesting uh, book reviews, uh, uh, exhibition reviews, exhibition previews, things coming up really all over the world. Uh, and. Um, uh, and there are a variety of other uh, unusual features, but one of which every week on the last page of the review section is called Masterpiece. And the art editor, who uh, I got to know quite well, became a good friend and wrote a very sweet introduction uh, uh, to this book. Uh, I said, why don't you just, uh, uh, in the introduction, say something about how this came to be. Uh, anyway, early on with those arts pages, um, uh, Paul Gigo, uh, who was then the senior editor, uh, put together these pages and asked Gibson to uh, uh, oversee this particular feature, masterpiece. Week after week, and it's not just American art, all, all kinds of, of works are, are discussed. And, and that's what's fun about it. each week. You have no idea uh, what, what's going to be featured. Uh, architecture, jazz records, uh, uh, literature, Japanese temples, French cathedrals, uh, obviously Fran uh, uh, traditional European and American painting. Out of the blue in 2006, and it was that summer, I, I got an email from him, I had never met, met him, uh, asking if I would write one of these masterpieces. I don't know how my name had come to his attention, whether he'd read some of my essays or not, doesn't matter. Uh, but it was a wonderful moment and began what for me has been a terrific exercise. Uh, as you've heard, yes, I have, I have written a number of monographs, survey books, uh, uh, you know, longer pieces, catalog essays, you name it. But the exercise, the challenge of writing a short essay for a general readership is particularly demanding. Uh, initially, these were to be a thousand words. In the last few years, they've uh, gone back to 850, which is even more compact. It's an excruciating uh, editing process. And you have to, uh, on the one hand, you can't write for the lowest common denominator. You're certainly not writing uh, for professional colleagues. Uh, you're trying to obviously reach a general readership. Uh, and uh, I hope. Uh, and as the series had come, come across, say something fresh. Try and say so, some, something original. And so I thought what I'd do this afternoon is as quickly as I can, and my students know quickly <laughs> <laughs> it drags on. Uh, I thought rather than just give you the art history in the book itself, although I'll touch on uh, 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 some of the points, I thought it might be more fun and interesting to talk about why I chose the work. Because one of the things I'd learned um, about the series, and as I began to think about the various pieces I might write about, uh, is that it's not about the most famous work by a given artist. Uh, uh, even Leonardo, there was a piece um, within the last year, but, uh, it, but it was, needless to say, not on the Mona Lisa. It was on the beautiful lady with an ermine, I think in Stockholm, I've forgotten where it is. Uh, uh, I'm sorry? Yes. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was a lesson. And um, likewise, uh, there are unexpected things where the case is made to look closely, to see something really in a whole new, whole new light. That, that was the premise. So with that in mind, I, I began the first essay I wrote, in the, and the book has organized them chronologically by artist and work of art uh, from the earliest period. You see here on the left, John Singleton Copley, uh, and we'll end up with Andrew Wyeth. As the series got, as I began to write, and, and, and in some cases, 
uh, Eric Gibson uh, would ask me to write on something. He either suggests something in a museum, something he'd seen, something he thought was worth doing, uh, or in other cases, he'd, he'd let me come up with something. Over time, I guess he had confidence in what I was doing because he just simply let me uh, produce essays, send them in, and then as time permitted, um, uh, uh, they got published. Uh, it seems to uh, be about every three or four months uh, he takes something. Uh, by the time this had gone on for two or three, four years, I realized that uh, I intentionally, as it were, was writing about a different artist or a different uh, period uh, or even a different medium uh, over time. And the idea came to me, not in the beginning, uh, that eventually, I had no, no idea when, eventually these might make um, a, a nice little book. Uh, and so I, as time went on, I became more conscious about choosing things that would fill out the chronology. This is not a definitive survey. Uh, it's a kind of quirky, as you'll see, really personal survey. Uh, and in the end, uh, uh, over these, what, 13 years, uh, there's not just American painting, uh, some of my favorite um, uh, works of American architecture, uh, a couple of pieces of sculpture, there's an important fo photograph by Carlton Watkins. Uh, so I, I, the idea was to play with, a ver to give a touch on uh, ways of looking closely. So I'll give you a sense of what was the appeal or what was the hook that got me into, uh, into this. Uh, the Homer will come to, obviously, in its place uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a moment. Uh, I think it was maybe three or four years into, into this project, uh, project that th these exercises that I thought, uh, well, you know, Copley is our first and most famous American painter, the great painter of the, of the revolution and the colonial period. Any of you who know Copley's work realize he was a master painter both of men and women. Uh, I love to discuss with students uh, was, which, he, which was he better at, painting women or of men. It's a wonderful dilemma, and I'm not sure there's a clear answer, but it's a good discussion. Uh, but it's also true that Copley, oh, you don't? There you, there you, thank you. <laughs> We're gonna do the whole thing with a blank screen. <laughs> See what, see how much you can, see how much you can take. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, there's all this technology that's beyond my threshold. Of slides here, slides there that I can't see. So, uh, uh, so I, I knew I had to discuss a Copley. Well, anybody who knows Copley's work, he was very prolific even after he left Boston to, to during the Revolution to go to England. Uh, but I was particularly interested in the American period. And I could probably tick off uh, three or four, half a dozen wonderful portraits by Copley of women, similarly of men. Uh, so what a dilemma. How, how was I to choose? And then the idea came to me uh, at, the, at the height of his career, just before leaving Boston in 1774, he decided to take on, the, and I think it was a challenge, the task of painting a double portrait. Uh, in Boston, he had painted a whole variety of paired portraits, men and women, uh, married uh, couples, uh, but he had never painted them together. There was one very early picture he painted of the Gore children, I think in the 17, doesn't matter, 60s, that was rather awkward. And he must have felt it was awkward because he never painted uh, for another two decades a double portrait until this year, this crucial year before he leaves uh, as a result of the revolution uh, in 1774. One is in Boston of Winslow, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Winslow. This one here that you see on the left uh, is Governor and Mrs. Thomas Mifflin. It's now in the Philadelphia Museum. Uh, and um, uh, Mifflin, the Mifflins went to Boston the year before the summer of 73 uh, to sit for Copley. In fact, there are accounts that Mrs. Uh, Mrs. W uh, Mifflin uh, said, almost got annoyed because uh, she had to spend something like 20 hours having her hand uh, posing uh, with her hands. Uh, that's another story. It's gotten me now writing a book on hands. It's, it's, all, it's all out of control. Uh, but 
but what I loved about this, so I chose this one. I think of the, of the two, uh, this is by far the most subtle and the most beautiful. It's a vertical format, as you can see, and the, th the, the seated figures are reinforced by that column on the right-hand side. Uh, but there's also this inter uh, intersection with horizontals, the table, the hands crossing over, the glances, and so forth. Now today, uh, it, it, you know, one can plug in push all the gender uh, uh, identi uh, identity buttons. Um, uh, uh, the male is seated on the left-hand side in darkness. He's therefore in the interior, in the more contemplative space. Uh, Mrs. Mifflin is seated on the right-hand side, closest to nature, the feminine. Uh, he's, of course, holding a book. Uh, she is uh, holding threads uh, for a loom. So all those identity things are there. But what is really interesting is how he suggests a sense of equality between male and female. Even though he is slightly taller, uh, and he was taller, uh, he is seated behind the table a little bit further back. Uh, she is slightly lower, but is forward. In other words, it equals out. And then what I began to realize as I was writing about it, there's the crucial play of these hands reaching across the table. And it, to me, it, uh, it was the final detail I commented on. To me, it's just genius the way those hands overlap, uh, <coughs> his and hers. Now, let me just see if I can look at that. Can you see? Uh, that pairing of his hand above, hers below, in a very similar pose, in the end, it's the ultimate essence of, is it not, of marital harmony. Uh, it, it's just such a touching. So th this is a case where one, I you know, uh, went through uh, the organ with myself what to write about. And then as I got into it, uh, s some of these details, which I thought were really exceptional and carry this touching meaning. Uh, and Copley, th these are not particularly psychological portraits, although they, c although they come close. But he's clearly interested in the interaction of the two, and I think uh, a painting of enormous success. Uh, uh, after the revolution, the next one of the great painters that emerges, Charles Wilson Peale, uh, also goes to England to study, comes back, uh, uh, becomes the classic Philadelphia painter along with Gilbert Stuart, uh, founder of uh, 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 our first museum, the Columbianum in Philadelphia, and uh, 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 also uh, a prodigious father, sired a dozen children, uh, and with in extraordinary ambition, I mean, it seems almost uh, amusing, but extraordinary ambition named uh, uh, the children by, he had three wives, the, the first one uh, named them all after artists. So we have Raphael Peel and Rembrandt Peel, Angelica Kaufman Peel, Titian Peel. Uh, you know, in America, can you imagine in 18, you know, 1799, uh, that, that sense of ambition? And then the next set of children were named after famous scientists. This was an age of art and science, Benjamin Franklin Peel, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, but here, the, for me, it was not so much a portrait that I thought would be important. Uh, and this is considered one of his masterworks, whether it, you think of it as his most famous or not. But it is, his, to me, it, his most unusual. It's called the Staircase Group. Uh, it's um, in the Pennsylvania Academy. It was originally painted uh, uh, to be installed in the upper floor of Independence Hall where his art collection and exhibits w were shown. And as you can see, and, I, and somebody's pointed out uh, quite rightly, it's disappointing that in the book, they have only, only reproduced, I say they, not we, me, uh, they have uh, reproduced just the image of the painting itself. The point being, as you can see here, that the door frame serves as the picture frame. And there's this wonderful illusionist play back and forth between uh, uh, the painted world and the world in which it's, in the world in which it's installed. Moreover, not just the, uh, the door frame uh, is three-dimensional, but the lower step here is a physical wooden step that has been added uh, to the bottom of the painted steps. And on the second step, uh, you may be able to just make out 
at the feet of Raphael Peel uh, is uh, uh, Peel's uh, uh, calling card. Well, actually, it's the ticket to his museum. Uh, it was said that he had his boys posing for him, his two sons, Titian at the upper left, uh, Raphael in the center, both turning to look at this. It's as if Peel set up his easel and said, boys, look at me for a second. There's this kind of stopped action. It's quite remarkable. Uh, in other words, it is a life-size trompe l'oeil, a life-size illusionist, uh, uh, illusionist picture. Uh, it's interesting that Raphael is the centerpiece. He was the oldest son, uh, in many ways the most talented, and ultimately, to the chagrin of uh, particularly his father, he emerged as a better artist than his father, a greatest art uh, artist, uh, mostly of still lives, but nonetheless uh, brought on great resentment by his father. I'll come back to that in, in, in uh, uh, just a moment. Finally, uh, think about this. This is a this narrow vertical portrait uh, Full-length portraits were exceedingly rare in America. Uh, the tradition, certainly in England and Europe, is that, that uh, the full-length portrait was reserved for the upper class, for royalty. Uh, and so there's a kind of, to me, a kind of radical, uh, you know, declaration of artistic independence here, where Peel takes the idea of the full-length portrait and democratizes by showing two ordinary people, and they're not even standing upright in the center of the composition. Uh, there's this marvelous kind of play of imbalance between uh, the, the two figures that gives it a wonderful spontaneity and, and, and informality. And so all of these intriguing things I loved about this picture, uh, and uh, so that was a, a, a you know a, a kind of of no brainer. Now uh, the next chronologically is indeed a Gilbert Stuart there on the left. It's of Dr. William Smith, who is uh, an Oxford dean, actually born in, in Scotland, came and studied in Philadelphia, went back and got his degrees. Uh, at Oxford and Aberdeen, and then returned to Philadelphia as either the first, I can remember, or the second provost of the new University of Pennsylvania. This portrait is of, uh, of Smith after his retirement. He's come back, he's retired in Philadelphia. There's a view of the Schuylkill River there in the background where Smith actually had, uh, had property. Uh, this was a case, again, a kind of quirky decision. This came up for auction. Many of you know I've been working with Alice Walden for years on creating her museum in, in Arkansas, Crystal Bridges. And I remember this came up for auction, I think, at Sotheby's. And I made her look closely at it. I said, we really should get it. This is an extraordinarily interesting Gilbert Stewart, uh, uh, mainly because of its format. <coughs> So to my knowledge, almost every other Gilbert Stewart portrait is a vertical rectangle. Uh, and so he, I just thought compositionally, this is an interesting kind of challenge. Uh, in this case, again, the figure is not even in the center of the composition, set to the right-hand side. Uh, and then you realize that it, it, it is a portrait, yes, but it's also a landscape painting, one of America's first. Uh, and of course, it's a still life. There on the left-hand part of the screen uh, is uh, um, the surveying instruments, the telescopes for uh, uh, horizontal and, and vertical uh, uh, surveying by, by Smith. Uh, so it's as if he wanted to show off the, and, and explore the, the various new subjects uh, beyond just likeness. And so it's an important picture uh, about, I think it's about 1800 itself. Uh, and then the final thing that I thought was so uh, beautiful about it uh, is, uh oh, I touched something. Uh -oh. How do I get rid of that? No, we don't do that. Oh, you don't? Oh, good. I, <laughs> I do. Something is coming. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> I'll just wing it. Uh, no, uh, uh, is. The emergence of the still life is a new subject. The emergence of landscape, which as I say, in 1800, this is going to be the great subject of the 19th century uh, in American art. So uh, th again, quirky reasons, but one that I thought was sort of worth acquiring for the museum, uh, but also worth um, uh, 
uh, uh, it was the right steward for this book. Now on the right hand screen is by Raphael Peel, his son. It's not in the book, but I included it uh, because it got published um, uh, this last March. And it's a quite important still life. In this case, uh, it was Gibson himself who suggested me uh, he'd been to Kansas City where Julian, you've just, uh, the director has, has just presided. Uh, uh, and those of us in the field always knew this picture, but Raphael Peel, the, as I say, the, the oldest son and, the, and in a way the most talented, was known almost entirely for small tabletop uh, still lifes, that is say bowls, baskets of oranges, apples, uh, peaches, uh, on, a, on a spare table shrouded in darkness. They're extraordinarily beautiful, elegant, succinct, uh, and again, radical for their time. Peel painted these still lives, um, oh, between 1810 and 1824 when he, when he uh, uh, died. Uh, and uh, so here again, a dilemma. What Peel to choose? Uh, and as I say, Gibson triggered. He said, why not try uh, this? It, it, I was a little reluctant at first, while I'd always loved it just for its technical aspects, the illusionism of the, of the sheet or the, of the cloth hanging in front of the nude. Uh, I wasn't sure what, quite what to say about it. So as one does, you dig into curatorial files and see what, the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, what information there is. Originally, the painting was known, as, for obvious reasons, as After the Bath, uh, which was a particular exhibition title from the 1820s. And so for many, many years, uh, that was how it was published. Somewhere along the line, one of my colleagues must have discovered uh, an English uh, engraving after a painting uh, by an English, uh, uh, I believe, yeah, 19th century artist, James Barry, or maybe 18th century, James Barry, uh, who had painted a picture called uh, 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 Venus Rising from the Sea Dash a Deception. Uh, and it was very clear that was the title of, of this image. So as curators and conser conservators do, they began to do work on this. Uh, and the first thing th that conservation discovered, I guess through radiography and x-rays, uh, is that this appeal uh, had painted this over another canvas. Uh, it appeared to be a, a, a bust portrait. Uh, it was always assumed that that, un that initial canvas, which he had taken and reused, uh, was a self-portrait, something that he'd begun uh, and decided not to finish for whatever reason, turned it around and, and did this. Now, one of the deceptions about this picture, it's very actually quite a small painting, uh, maybe at the most 15, 20 inches wide. In other words, it's, it's of a still life scale, but particularly when you see it as a reproduction as here, it's much easier to read it as a life-size nude with a bed sheet drawn across as a curtain. That was a Dutch convention that uh, uh, both European and Americans uh, uh, drew on. So it became a rather intriguing picture of what, what was Raphael doing here? Uh, he's overlaying one painting with another, and yet the uh, this, this second painting appears to be itself a copy of something. Uh, and so I began to go into this question of layers. And then finally you have, of course, the curtain itself, which is the ultimate forward layer. And on that curtain, uh, I, you may be able to make there in the lower right-hand corner, uh, on the sheet is Raphael Peel's signature. As if he has, is you going to use this blank sheet as yet a new canvas to paint his work of art. That's one way of thinking about it. Uh, it's a, and it was said at the time that he painted this to tease or taunt his wife, Patty, uh, uh, which given the subject may very well be the case. Imagine the, the wife coming into the garage and there's the nude uh, uh, <laughs> behind a curtain. Uh, although the painting itself, uh, they, everybody writes about it as a handkerchief or a dinner napkin. So there's this marvelous kind of, of play of illusion of scales here. Uh, 
R well, recently, the most recent conservation was done, I think, in Philadelphia of this underpainting. It's always intrigued people. And damned if it didn't turn out that it has been established that the original canvas was painted by his father, Charles Wilson Peel, of Raphael. So there is a, obviously, you know, now we get into the pop psychology, and of course is what we love to do as teachers, as, as I say, uh, go along. But no, it, it occurs, to, you know, now occurs to me that, you know, this was a real self, a, 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 a real effacement of not only his father's painting, but is literally his father's hand. I remember years ago, uh, a, a Philadelphia art historian had written a, 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 an essay about Raphael Peel, uh, who did have alcohol problems. He had gout. Uh, he had a really. He, he died a year before his father. He uh, was very sick. Uh, and I've always thought that these beautiful still lives were a kind of retreat for him. That's a different aspect. Uh, but uh, here, uh, one can begin. Anyway, she argued that, Rafa, that uh, Charles Wilson uh, actually uh, was, was poisoning his son, Raphael, who was working for him in the museum doing taxidermy and therefore exposed month after month to arsenic. And at the time, we thought this is a really extreme, preposterous uh, 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 idea. Now I'm not so sure uh, whether it was deliberate or a, uh, clearly there was some kind of, of tension, uh, some kind of Oedipal uh, malice between the two uh, that is the final, in a sense, deception uh, in, in, um, uh, in this marvelous painting. Now, I cannot advance. The, the screen has seized up on me. What have I done? That came up. Oh. And magic. <laughs> this is, realize this is all theater. Uh, <laughs> at some point, I, as I say, I thought I really ought to tackle American architecture. I was taught it, uh, and among my favorite architects, the earliest is Charles Bullfinch, uh, the Boston architect working in the federal mode, uh, in a sense the northern equivalent to Thomas Jefferson in Virginia. Later you'll see in a moment uh, a, a library by um, Henry uh, Richardson, uh, the great, uh, to me, the great architect of the later 19th century. So again, the question, what, what Bullfinch? He, 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 uh, he, he really transformed Boston from a city in, in uh, wood to a city, one wants to say, in brick. Uh, uh, working in this delicate neoclassical uh, manner that we call the, the, um, the federal style. It's not full-blown Greek revival with solid forms. There's both delicacy as well as classicism here. Uh, <coughs> he did any number of houses for the wealthy in Boston, Harrison Gray Otis, designed the Boston State House, many more, in a sense, important, uh, much more familiar works. What I chose was in a sense, a later work um, that he does in the hinterlands, western Massachusetts, in Lancaster, uh, north of Worcester. Uh, this is the Lan so-called Lancaster Meeting House, uh, about 1824. Uh, so it still has much of the uh, federal vocabulary, particularly the portico. Uh, you can see the similarities even you know, to its Virginia cousins of Monticello. Uh, and that wonderful sort of simple, uh, brick blocks in the background that play. Clearly, Bullfinch was interested in these pure geometries being uh, tied together. And then it builds up. Uh, look at the uh, this wonderful crescendo of just abstract forms that you have going up uh, from uh, the roof line to the bell tower, and then finally the, the, the cupola itself. You may distinguish that the cupola seems heavier. It is. It's a more solid vocabulary that was just coming into favor 
uh, as architects like Bullfinch and others were being called on to design the new neoclassical capital buildings for the states as they were being added uh, to the Union beginning in the 1820s uh, or right through the, the, uh, the 50s. And so this, here's an interesting case, as I say, just from an art historian's point of view, uh, to see the federal style giving way in one work to the coming uh, a Greek, uh, Greek revival. So it has all the juicy, pure elements of, of, of Bullfinch, but a much more unfamiliar work, at least to most people. Uh, below it uh, is the great painting by Samuel F. B. Morse. This again was something that the uh, journal suggested to me. It was on loan at the this belongs to the Terra Foundation in Chicago. This is the interior of the Gallery of the Louvre. Uh, painted uh, uh, again in the 1820s by Samuel F. B. Morse, uh, who of course uh, equally famous for the, uh, 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 for the telegraph uh, and uh, other scientific uh, contributions, uh, but a major painter in his, in his time, both portraiture and now does this kind of elaborate, this is the first moment in a sense American artists, even the early 19th century, are now going abroad. Uh, going to the Louvre to look at the old masters. It is a kind of contrivance in that the room in the foreground is called a Salon Carré uh, and was a kind of special exhibition space. Almost all of these paintings have been identified in the background. There's a Turner, uh, there, uh, there are various kinds of other Renaissance paintings that were all in the collection of the Louvre but were actually hung in distant galleries or other spaces. And uh, Morris has taken the liberty, of course, of um, assembling them in his own arrangement here uh, in the foreground, places himself uh, in the f in immediate foreground there, overlooking the shoulder of his daughter, giving her uh, a painting lessons. So it's a picture that is a kind of history piece. It's a genre, that is to say, in everyday life, uh, the human subject matter uh, in the foreground. Uh, this was a case where uh, the Terra Foundation was sending it on na a national tour and at this particular point happened to be on loan to the National Gallery, an institution I, I had worked for and, and, and had always loved, uh, and was hanging in one of those marble uh, hallways. And uh, so it was kind of, for me, the hook was, it was not, Morris is not my favorite artist, but I loved the idea of this picture being uh, of one great uh, uh, museum interior being hung inside uh, another. So maybe, you know, the lightest of reasons, but nonetheless, uh, one that was uh, a, a way of getting into this. Uh, brings me to uh, the, the 1840s and the, the emergence of, as I say, genre painting, the painting of everyday life. Uh, two great masters, uh, William Sidney Mount on the left, eel spearing at Sea Talcott, Long Island, 1845. And two years later, his uh, then Western, now Midwestern counterpart, George Caleb Bingham, painting a group of flatboatmen on uh, the, the Missouri River. But first, Mount. Uh, it's a classic picture. This would be thought of as of certainly one of his masterpieces. But what m m interested me about it, in a sense, was the, uh, the obvious. That is to say, it is a painting, if you think about it, now this is 1845, we're still antebellum, but racial tensions, abolitionism, uh, sectionalism are all beginning to fester in the 40s and will carry on into the 50s and finally explode. So it's painted in a, an important moment when Mount decides to depict figures whom he knew, these were farm hands out in where he grew up in uh, central uh, Long Island, uh, but if you think about it, uh, the, the three marginalized citizens, as it were, in the country at that time were blacks, women, and children. And of course, it's two figures here, but he's compressed them, the, the black woman and a young boy. So there's something very attentional 
intentional uh, and to me very beautiful about insisting on painting these as almost heroic figures. The composition is almost a classical pyramid. Uh, there's this incredible stillness of light and atmosphere. America, as it were, at high noon. Uh, a, a picture of extraordinary optimism. And it made me realize that Mount is one of our few painters, certainly of that period, who could paint the African-American with sympathy, with sensitivity. It's not a caricature. It's an extraordinary likeness. Uh, and uh, here they are in early morning in the marshes out there, uh, 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 fishing, uh, uh, eel fishing for crabs. Uh, so that was, in, as I say, uh, an, an obvious way of getting into and rethinking a, a very important, beautiful picture. Bingham, of course, is known, his classic pictures are these great flatboatman paintings. Uh, he began in um, uh, eight, also the same year, 1845, and we've always wondered who was looking at whom or whether it was sim simply a kind of spontaneous uh, a parallel, uh, one on the East Coast, one in the Midwest at the time. In any case, uh, Bingham's first flat, uh, flatboatman pictures are would thought to be, again, the most famous. There's the jolly flatboatman in Washington with the dancing figure at the apex of the triangle on the boat. Uh, in, in the Met, his fur traders descending the Missouri, two boatmen uh, gliding in a, a dugout canoe. Those pictures and the first ones in the series, one wants to say, I realize, I'm sorry, are, are about nostalgia. Uh, uh, about a past America that is being oversettled and changed. Uh, they're a reminiscence of Missouri in the 1820s, not the 1840s. This picture, uh, called, uh, it's called Lighter Relieving a Steamboat Aground. A lighter was one of these big, heavy flat boats uh, that w was to, to, to work its way up to the uh, steamboat, as you can make out, I hope, barely there in the background, uh, has run aground on a sandbar. And uh, uh, <coughs> uh, it, it, its job was to go and relieve or lighten the load uh, so that it could, the, the steamer could be uh, moved. Uh, but on a close look, this is a picture, therefore, of a contemporary moment very contemporary, as I'll come to in just a second. Uh, uh, this is not nostalgia. Uh, these are real working figures. But even more, compared to the, its predecessors, everything is, a, if not in disarray, on the edge of disarray. The oars, which in the earlier versions were parallel across the, uh, the barge itself, neatly framed. Uh, everything was in balance in a perfect pyramid. Now, of course, the, the pole that the central figure holds is slightly off-center. Things are a little bit off-kilter. Uh, the, the box there on the lower right-hand corner is almost on the edge of, of teetering off the barge itself. Uh, there's a coil of rope that is about to fall into the water. The man on the left has a shirt that is torn. In the back one here, of course, is smoking. In the background, another uh, is uh, drinking from a jug of whiskey. In other words, they, they have no intention of worrying about the light of the steamboat in the background. This, we now realize, is a political picture. Well, sure enough, if you dig, and one of my colleagues did, uh, I'm happy to take credit, but uh, uh, th this was a colleague who argued quite correctly uh, uh, Bingham, we know, was a politician. He actually ran for state legislature uh, uh, on, in, in the Whig Party in, in Missouri. Uh, and his first election uh, was overturned by the Democratic legislature. Uh, and the election was thrown out. Let me just say he was pissed. Uh, <laughs> two years later, he ran again and was elected. So politics was also a passion of Bingham's, as it were. Uh, at this moment, and here's the steamboat aground, uh, uh, President Polk, James Polk, uh, had signed, or had signed actually a veto, he didn't sign the bill, he vetoed what was known then as the river and harbor bill that the Whigs were pushing, particularly for the interior of the country. 
the River and Harvard bid, bill would have provided money to clean and gouge the Mississippi, the great waterways, the harbors of the Gulf, et cetera, uh, to keep them clear of impediments, uh, because this is, after all, a rising moment of, of, of commerce. Uh, and so it's no surprise that on the right-hand side of this picture, you can just make out there's a very clear snag coming up through the water. So now the ship aground, to me, is a kind of almost a metaphor of, uh, you know, as, as Bingham saying, the ship of state is aground. Uh, in other words, Bingham was using his art to make a political commentary. And those who have looked at, look at my text um, or, or who know this painting, the delicious irony of this uh, presidential criticism is the location, current location of this picture. It's in the White House. Uh, it was acquired uh, during the Carter administration. It's a great George Caleb Bingham. At the time, of course, they had no idea, but I think it's just so wonderful that there it is sitting on the walls of the green room today. Uh, <coughs> The third major genre painter of the period, Richard Catton of Woodville, a, a Baltimore artist, uh, uh, painted this picture on the left, N not by, by no means uh, anywhere near as well known as Bingham uh, and, and Mount. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I chose this. Uh, equally talented technically, as you can see from the illusionism of this wonderful little pair, this, well, it's actually a trio of figures there in an interior. It's called Waiting for the Stage. Uh, uh, Woodville's intriguing, he only painted about a dozen, at the mo maybe 15, uh, really finished canvases, painted almost all of them in Dusseldorf where he'd gone to work in the new German style, but really of remembered Baltimore subjects where he, where he grew up. So that waiting for the stage means that we're looking at, and as I say, it's a small kind of stage-like interior uh, <coughs> of these figures. Uh, in uh, 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 probably the waiting room of a tavern or an inn uh, uh, for the stage. What caught my attention, and I think anybody's attention, is the standing figure uh, with shades, with the strong black glasses, reading a newspaper that says, The Spy. Well, you begin to think about it. What's going on here? Two card players. Uh, He's looking over the spy. Surely he's looking at one hand or the other and in, in, conclu in collusion, oh, sorry to use that word, uh, <laughs> in collusion with one of the figures uh, to cheat the other. But as you begin to try and figure out what's going on here, you really wonder if not all three of them are cheating. I don't, we don't really know. Uh, so it's a wonderful little story, uh, and probably, I think, to my knowledge, uh, the first painting of, uh, of dark eyeglasses, totally, of course, unnecessary uh, inside in, in a dark room. Uh, so it's a, it's a fun painting of extraordinary, uh, <laughs> as I say, uh, detail. Yet one final work uh, of this mid-century period, I realized, not surprisingly, uh, as one would, uh, that I needed to include uh, a significant African-American artist. And my favorite was, at least of mid-century, is, is Robert Duncanson, uh, whom you see here on the right. It's a painting called the Little, uh, it was called Blue Hole, Little Miami River. Uh, and uh, it, it's kind of interesting because you're not aware that it's a river. And I realized that a whole number of colleagues in the so-called Hudson River School had painted rivers, if not dammed up, at a particular term that looked like a, 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 a pond, a still pond with, again, reflection imagery. And when I say reflection, I'm thinking that these are artists who are interested in reflection in both senses of the word, metal meditation reflection, but also literal reflection. But what triggered this is not only, uh, as I say, I wanted to write about a Duncanson, but at the time, quite accidentally, I had been doing some work uh, and writing on Thoreau, uh, and particularly Walden, and, and Thoreau's journal for 1851, in which he talks about being at Walden and the pond. Uh, and I realized, of course, Walden itself is familiar to us, uh, Thoreau has all those comments uh, in, his, in his narrative about 
Walden Pond being a kind of oculus reflecting the sky. And so here, I'd always been interested in American studies and the correlations between literature uh, and painting, but here was a wonderful case where I could write about uh, Duncanson as a minority artist, but also being very much at the heart of this fascination uh, with the pond, the circle, the eye, and you know, there's Emerson's uh, 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 transparent eyeball. Uh, one can, it runs all through American literature and painting of the period. Uh, <coughs> Now, here was a case of, uh, of a kind of quasi-commission. Uh, Gibson, uh, he seems to have tagged me to write about things that can be published on national holidays. Uh, you may have seen the last one I did was for 4th of July, and I wrote on Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. But here was a case coming up to Washington's birthday, and Gibson suggested, would I write about the great painting in the Met called Washington Crossing the Delaware. You, you, you've all seen it. Uh, I personally don't like it. Uh, uh, I think it's a piece of kitsch. And I, uh, I, 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 I told him. And he said, well, write about what you want. And I thought, well, here's an occasion to write about an extremely difficult subject, the Washington Monument. What is there to say? It's, a, it's you know, an obelisk. There's nothing on it. There's no decoration. Uh, it's, it's just there. But, you know, but I thought about it in a number of ways. Uh, it's, it's location, as we know, on the Washington Mall. It's the one case that reminds you that Washington is, to my eyes, the only capital in the world where a work of art faces the public legislature, where government and art uh, are, if not intention, are, are each end of that mall. And then you think of the whole irony of the difficulty of the endowments and uh, the attitude towards the arts by the government. So I was able to play a little bit with, it, with its location. Its history is important. Robert Mills, I think, is our great neoclassical architect of the 1840s and 50s designs the Treasury Building, important buildings in South Carolina, many more important residential structures, public structures. But I thought the challenge of writing uh, about this, uh, you ha one has to mention his previous Washington Monument in Baltimore, where there's a, a frieze of figures and some on the top of the monument. What interested me was that with each iteration of these monuments, uh, uh, Mills becomes more austere, more minimalist. So in the end, is this a piece of sculpture? Uh, is it a piece of architecture? Uh, one can play with that. And then finally, as you may know, you can barely see in this slide, uh, it was incomplete in 1855, right there, about a third of the way up. The whole idea was, of course, and this had been going on for years, how to commemorate Washington and <coughs> the father of the country. Uh, and uh, so the idea was to put out a call to all of the existing states to contribute stone, which they did. But of course, as regionalism and sectionalism and all the rest began to fire up as we get into the mid-50s, border warfare in Kansas, Missouri, Many of the states simply refused to send, uh, send stone and <coughs> it and or money. So it, the whole uh, construction grinds to a halt in 1855. And I think it literally, <coughs> uh, uh, it, it, it um, uh, was heartbreaking for, for Mills. He died of, of heart failure that very year, I think because he could not get it, uh, get it complete. And, uh, and of course, not surprisingly, it, as you probably know, it wasn't finished then for a couple of decades more, certainly not in the run-up to the war or the war years or during Reconstruction. Uh, and it is only in at the time of the National Centennial in 1876 uh, that everybody grudgingly agreed that the Washington Monument ought to be finished. So construction then resumed in 1876 and was finally finished uh, in 1884. So you can, see, I think if you look closely, you can see that the color of the stone actually is, it changes at that uh, third way mark. Uh, 
the artists with which I'm most associated began my career, Fitz Henry Lane. Uh, I knew I had to write uh, about Lane. <laughs> I should say my ardent critics have said I've done nothing but <laughs> rewrite myself throughout my career. Uh, but, uh, you know, for me, where I know every Lane, you know, like Hadlock Raisin, what do you choose? Well, Lane's late work is the sublime work, uh, where he gets to this almost mystical kind of, of picture. Uh, 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 this is, a, we believe, about 1860. It's the, uh, uh, the ship Starlight in the Fog. There was an earlier version done several years before at a wharf, which suggests sort of a more con uh, a close observation of, of an actual moment. Here we can't tell where we are because the fog is closed in. It would appear to me that it's a fairly large harbor, not because just because of the vessel in the foreground, but faintly in the distance you can also make several other uh, uh, large schooners that suggest deep water. Whether this is Boston or Salem, Marblehead, Portsmouth, uh, in, uh, but I think the point is that uh, by 1860, Lane almost certainly wanted to make this, uh, if not universal, wanted to, to take it out of an identifiable place. Uh, I've used the adjective in writing about it, hallucinatory. This, br and again, just brilliant technique, not just his rigging with which we know uh, he was so, so adept, just brilliant at straight line uh, 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 hand drawing of, of his rigging. Nobody could equal Lane in, in that regard. But it's this attention to light and atmosphere uh, moving what I like to call away from, uh, the, from painting as prose to painting as poetry, this kind of meditative, as I say, uh, uh, almost inner light, where the sun is, ju we feel, is just burning the, 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 the mist off, but not quite there yet. And the, as you see, the bowsprit of the, sh of the starlight reaches forward at an angle, uh, and you feel it's going to join up with the little red burgee at the top of the, of the catboat there in the foreground. Uh, they are coming together and, and will pierce the center of sun uh, up there in the upper left. So I like to think of this as having two sides, the material side on the right uh, and the cosmic side on the left. And I know you're mumbling, he's getting carried away again. Uh, <laughs> but as I say, for 1860, with all the horror, the war about to break out, uh, fighting already taking place, uh, the country in, in terrible turmoil. This, I think, is a case of an artist, uh, in a sense, going into another world, a kind of retreat to find peace and serenity while the world is exploding uh, around him. So even for me to go back to Lane, uh, it was a, a marvelous kind of exercise. Uh, in the 18, again, 60s, 62, two years later than Lane's painting, uh, the other, and this was, was the last uh, work I wrote about before the book went to press, and, but I absolutely knew Frederick Church had to be included because over time, I think almost all of us feel now the church is our greatest painter of mid-century America. And here's a case where to move from the Lane, just two years later, Church is painting, to be sure, it's a South American landscape. This is Cotopaxi uh, in um, uh, uh, northern Ecuador. Uh, and, and in fact, Church had painted this very same volcano uh, a decade before, but not exploding with, with a kind of ice cone. I like to think of an ice cream cone. Uh, benign world, a uh, harmonious world. Now, as you see, quite obviously, the world is exploding. And to me, this was the insight into how American artists, in a sense, interpreted uh, and, and discussed, as it were, in visual terms, American history uh, in terms of nature. Because now nature is literally exploding. Uh, that great plume of black smoke, the, the volcano, is now in dialogue, in conflict, about to obliterate the sun itself. Uh, now, in the meantime, uh, church has read Darwin, 
this is about uh, the survival of the fittest, not only of landscape and so forth. This is a kind of Dar new Lord Darwinian, lands Darwinian landscape uh, where everything is uh, at, at, b at battle with, with everything else. And so even the water seems to be on fire in, in, in the foreground, uh, the, the ultimate picture for the Civil War period itself. After the war, and this brings us to the painting I began this whole series with, the Winslow Homer, a famous painting uh, known at the time uh, as, as a fair wind, uh, now much more familiarly as, a bre as breezing up. So this is the first commission I had. What am I going to choose? Well, I ha had, as, as you probably heard, uh, I had been curator at the National Gallery of American Art uh, for 11 years uh, in, the, in, the, in the 80s. And me to say, Homer was one of my favorite artists. This ended up it being on the cover of the book, I, the monograph I published on Homer. So it was a picture that was absolutely familiar. Uh, but that, in a way, wasn't enough because every, almost everybody knows Homer. Probably most have seen this picture. What, what new is there to say? Well, I thought one thing I could do in this afternoon, in a way, we're all familiar, uh, is, is in a sense get into it by talking about those clouds. Who, everybody talked about the boys, but the clouds, is, as you all know, uh, is a familiar kind of phenomenon here uh, in the summer months after uh, a, a warm front has gone through and dry air comes, uh, comes, uh, comes down from, uh, from Canada and the breeze picks up and you have a consistent northwesterly. And I, I think this is exactly what Homer was painting. So I was at least able to talk about this from a point of view, so to speak, of familiarity. Uh, the, other, the other thing was, uh, which again is to the point here, uh, this is painted in 1876. One rhetorical question is, did Homer intend this to be a bicentennial picture? Uh, I mean, a centennial picture uh, celebrating America's youth and America's old age. He was very conscious of being a century old, older than any other con continuing government, uh, and yet perpetually new. The subject matter of boyhood is a dominant theme in American uh, painting of the 1870s, but particularly because it's coming during Reconstruction after the war. Youth was perceived, of course, to be America's future. And so to me, it is telling whether he intended it or not, or con consciously or not, as a, a centennial picture, uh, you have here, yes, the old salt, the old uh, Gloucester fisherman taking boys out on an afternoon sail. I think we all recognize that this is a strong but not dangerous breeze. It's an exciting breeze for these young boys, but it's not a threatening breeze. On the other hand, they are offshore. There is a reference to Gloucester on the stern, but there's no land in view. So these boys are off on an adventure at sea, as it were. But the final twist that I find so beautiful about it, and it may just be obvious, but uh, old and young. So the question is, who's missing? And obviously, who's missing, which is very much on Americans' mind through the 1870s, was the middle generation, the fathers, the brothers uh, who were lying in the battlefields <coughs> of Antietam and, and, and Gettysburg. So I think this is also about loss as well as, uh, as, well as promise. Uh, a few years later, totally different kind of subject matter, uh, needless to say. Uh, I certainly needed to include a, a, a woman artist, uh, probably our most famous and important 19th century is Mary Cassatt. This again was a picture familiar to me in the Paul Mellon collection of the National Gallery. But here's a case again uh, like the Peel um, uh, Venus, uh, that a conservation discovery was the hook into this. The gallery's cons conservation department did work on this, and as we know, Mary Cassatt went abroad, studied in France, was the only American to be accepted formally into the Impressionist movement, the only woman, uh, certainly American woman, to be accepted, became a great friend, we don't know how close a friend, to Edgar Degas, uh, and indeed uh, worked in his studio. He clearly tutored her, and one of the things that the cons conservation discovered is that much of the, it, it has a kind of Degas composition with that empty 
section of flooring in the middle of it. Wonderful play of four uh, stuffed chairs, each one cropped off at the edge, right, top, bottom, left. Uh, and so it's a play of almost abstraction. And then it has this marvelous sensuality. We know Mary Cassatt to be a painter of children and babies. But here he paints a young girl uh, on the edge, clearly, of puberty in this rather provocative position with her legs splayed out at us, her arm raised, uh, and this kind of come on slouch, uh, as if Cassatt is, uh, uh, Cassatt is playing with you know, ch uh, childhood youth coming adulthood. Uh, the, the, in other words, the, there's more to it. But it was discovered that, in fact, Degas did uh, alter much of the background, particularly the screen of, of windows there, straightened out the floor line uh, so that the eye rushes to that corner in the back space. That's a typical uh, Degas advice. So here's a picture where art historians can really talk about the collaborative hand between these uh, two important artists. I mentioned at the outset Carlton Watkins, since I wanted to include a photograph. Uh, I'd always felt that Watkins was even a superior photographer uh, to Edward Mybridge, much more familiar. Both gave us these extraordinary, wonderful wet plate images of Yosemite in the 1870s uh, and 80s. Uh, again, which one do you choose? Uh, I tried as, as, as I went, went along to select works that were in different museums around the country, small museums as well as large museums. Uh, and uh, here was a classic uh, you know, distillation of Yosemite, probably an early morning. Uh, in this case, it took going to Yosemite to understand uh, the power of those photographs, the grandeur here of El Capitan. Uh, but the fact that I recognize and you may know if you've been there, is that um, uh, the river, the Merced River in Yosemite Valley runs largely east-west. And as a result, ex to me explains why Albert Bierstadt painted so many paintings of sunset and sunrise in the Yosemite with the sun in the dead distance. In other words, in the summertime, the sunlight goes straight down, more or less parallels uh, the, the, uh, the, the direction of the valley itself. And so w for Watkins here, it's interested in, in light and dark, the play of foliage there, the three trees silhouetted against the flat rock, the water in the foreground. This is vocabulary that comes out of painting, uh, but which um, uh, Watkins is now exploiting in photography. That is to say, broken dead tree limbs alongside of new green shoots that even though this is a photograph of a place at a moment, it's really about, in a sense, the perception of nature as something constantly regenerating, dying and regrowing, even in photography. Uh, <coughs> as I mentioned earlier, here's H.H. Uh, Richardson, uh, famous for, of course, Trinity Church in Boston, uh, famous for this new, uh, 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 Romanesque revival style, uh, this heavy uh, Romanesque uh, 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 arches and stonework. One of the most great craftsmen and designers worked often uh, with Stanford White in decoration. Uh, also famous for the railroad stations around suburban Boston and a whole string of libraries of which I think this is the best. The Crane Library in uh, Quincy, Mass, south of Boston. Uh, and uh, obviously asymmetry comes into play here. Uh, but what I loved about it is it, this is the classic demonstration of form following function. The exterior shapes state clearly what's going on, what the form is. Obviously the entry portico is the main entry. The great horizontal on the left is the stack area. Uh, the the, 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 uh, the conical area next to the entrance uh, is a st obviously a staircase from one floor to the other, uh, which you can't particularly see. Uh, and in detail, even the spouts, the drain spouts, are done in cast stone. And he molds those spouts so that they come together from the, from the gutter uh, and the cornice line together. Uh, and it looks as if... Um, in a sense, the very water that runs through them has shaped the form of the stone. 
just sheer genius, his, his, his attention to detail. Another artist who always intrigued me, ended up writing, doing an exhibition, writing a book, on John F. Pito. Uh, here, ordinary objects from the artist's creative mind. William Hornet is probably much better known for his violins, for uh, his tabletops, and so forth. This is a picture done, again, in the, in the uh, 1880s, 90s, uh, about, as you can see, about disarray. It's pretty obvious. The torn pamphlets, uh, the hanging sheath, uh, the nails. Uh, but it's also an intriguing picture about art itself. Uh, the lower right is uh, a, a copy of one of Pito's own little still lifes of a pipe and mug. Above it is a Winslow Homer engraving of women at the beach. And then above that is a postcard of a sculpture, the various arts. Pito, it's a kind of autobiography. Pito was a trombonist played in the local uh, uh, marching band. So we have his trombone. We have his painter's palette at dinner as if he's put the palette down and gone out. So it's a wonderful picture to try and decipher, but it's also about wear and tear and erosion. This now is the end of the 19th century with um, coming of immigration and um, industrialization, urbanism, things falling apart. The, the coming of the 20th century seemed very threatening. So this is an important painting for that insight. Uh, my favorite sculpture, and this brings us to the greatest sculptor of the 19th century, Augustus St. Gordon's. Probably many of you know his much more familiar works, uh, the Shaw Memorial in Boston Common, uh, the William Sherman, Tecumseh Sherman Memorial in Central Park in New York. These are his famous public monuments. This one is, is the Adams Memorial, uh, which was uh, commissioned uh, to do a, a memorial to Clover Adams, Henry Adams' uh, wife, uh, who was a, a friend of all of theirs. Adams, you may know, the great public intellect, descendant of the Adams presidential line, uh, but never a president himself, but became more powerful than presidents, builds a house and looks directly across at Grant in the White House, uh, and. Uh, 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 really was more of a command center than the White House. In any case, Clover Adams, his wife, was quite a good professional photographer. And unaccountably, in a, you never know unaccountably, in 1885, she committed suicide by drinking photogra photographic chemicals. So the issue is then, how do you do a memorial to a su suicide, not condoned by any uh, you know, uh, known religion? Uh, uh, Adams himself went off to the South Seas with John Lafarge and said to St. Gordon's, do something. St. Gordon's had also traveled widely, and what he did was, I think, bring together, on the one hand, the, the, great, uh, the great figures of, of um, uh, Michelangelo and the Sistine Ceiling uh, with uh, 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 Japanese and Chinese Buddhas. Uh, so it's both Eastern and Western. Western. The figure itself is slightly larger than life size, so that while we assume it to be a woman, uh, the features are very uh, uh, universalized. Adams insisted on no inscription, no identification. It was where he intended to have his own uh, body rest after his death. So, and it's surrounded by this beautiful woodland uh, 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 group of trees that um, uh, Stanford White referred to as an arboreal room. So it's a place of kind of, not easy to find in Rock Creek Cemetery, but once you're in it, facing the, the, the plinth there, that stone with a seated bronze figure, is another uh, stone settee, as it were, at the far end of, the, of this little grove. And that settee, as it were, uh, invites you, almost forces you to sit down and face the sculpture and contemplate your own, uh, your own mortality. But the hooker here, uh, which I come to at the end of the essay, that I discovered only by going there, that's what you have to do with works of art, is see them. And in this case, I only realized when I got there that the, that St. Gordon's had oriented this to the west, not to the east as religious morals, if it is religious, uh, would normally face. Uh, 
And the reason I discovered as the day wore on, as you can make out, uh, is that the face, of course, is shrouded, which adds to its mystery. And only as the sun is setting do the rays reach up underneath and illuminate the face. It's, it's just, it's magical. Uh, Thomas Aikens, our other greatest, Homer's our greatest landscape painter. Uh, come on, get on with it here. Uh, uh, Aikens is our greatest portrait painter. There are all kinds of Aikens, as one could have chosen, much more famous. Uh, the rowing pictures, the, uh, the great clinic paintings in Philadelphia. Uh, but he is our great portrait. And I, so again, I, I set myself the challenge of painting one that is, 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 is bust length, it has no hands, no body, no accessories to be held on, nothing, no chair or barely a chair visible in the background. This is a painting of a, of, of a retired, and some have said failed concert singer, Mrs. Edith Mahan in the Smith College collection, uh, painted uh, at the end of her life. Uh, in, in 1904, and something of that poignance and tenderness that we saw in the pedo still life carry over to these watery eyes. Here's a, an artist who, and mind you, this is done at the very moment of the discovery of, uh, of psychiatry. Uh, it also happens to be the very moment of the first x-ray, and Aikens was clearly interesting, interested in penetrating the interior. So th this was a wonderful picture to spend time on, uh, that, that, the, that the key, of course, is the face, and finally the eyes. Uh, yes, there's the, the hint of the chair, there's the hint of the lace dress below, but it's all about the psychology, uh, psychology of the sitter, uh, and facing us directly. The daring of a sitter or an artist looking directly into each other's eyes. We all know from cocktail points, it's often hard to look at each other in the, in the eye. You want to look over the shoulder, look at the name tag. Uh, Aikens, for his most powerful portraits, I tell you, uh, insisted on this kind of direct, uncompromising vision. As you can imagine, a lot of sitters didn't like them, refused to pay for them, refused to accept them. This is one of his greatest works, particularly uh, on a small scale. She's telling me I need water. I do. I can now carry on. Uh, uh, thank you. All right, we're in the 20th century. We're finally going to get there. Uh, the, the child has some flag picture, flag uh, on uh, uh, Fifth Avenue, it was again a commission. Uh, Eric Gibson uh, had pointed out that this, pi well, this picture has a famous history. It belong originally belonged to Brooke Astor and then went through that tumultuous history of being sold out, of, out from under her, uh, the contested will, all of that story that we know. Uh, it ended up being bought by um, uh, Richard Gilder, or was it Lerman? I associate the, I think it was Richard Gilder. And <coughs> on July 4th, I want to say two or three years ago, it was a July 4th, Gilder decided he was going to give it to an institution he, he had supported all his life, uh, the New York Historical Society. So here was an occasion to write about 4th of July uh, with the American flags. These are, of course, World War I images, uh, the armistice, celebrations, uh, also a uh, case of an American artist doing impressionist technique, uh, that this is both about a street scene, but also about sky and atmosphere, the daubs of figures there uh, in, in, in the foreground. The figure five in gold uh, is one of the most important. Here's the case, but just because I had been working on early American modernism, and over the years actually had become a friend of the pop artist Robert Indiana here in Vinyl Haven. Uh, and Indiana, in this period, uh, was painting uh, his own versions of, of, of the Charles Demuth picture, which you have here, the figure five. It intrigued him. And he got me interested in it. And I realized that Indiana, as an artist, was one of the first to pay attention to the early American modernists. Uh, both painters and writers, Gertrude Stein, William Carlos Williams, who was the uh, poet uh, behind this picture. Uh, it was triggered by um, uh, Demuth, uh, who, uh, it was said, was on his way 
to visit another modernist, Morriston Hartley, in Lower Manhattan on a rainy night. Uh, I'm sorry, it, 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 William Carlos Williams, the poet, uh, who was a friend of theirs. After uh, a fire engine goes by on a rainy night with a figure five on it, Williams jots down one of these modernist poems, I saw the figure five in gold on a rainy night, et cetera, et cetera, and jots his poem down, which then became the occasion for his friend Charles Demuth to paint this picture. So the five, I think, is symbolic in the number of figures involved, Demuth, Alfred Stieglitz, uh, Hartley, uh, one could go on, I'm not sure. But it, it's also, of course, a modernist, almost cubist picture in which you have the fire engine coming down the street at you with the five, and then the idea with the rushing lights and ground, uh, uh, the, 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 the engine going by you. So it's both a frontal and a side view, and hence five seen in a variety of, of cinematic uh, sequences. Uh, so this was a case I got into, you know, again, for almost accidental reasons uh, and thought it'd be, it would be worth trying to decipher. The one key detail which we also reproduce, I call your attention to, is for years everybody just assumed that the word here on the right, uh, uh, you know, barely cropped, says art co. But if you look closely at the original, there is another letter right at the edge of that red border of the fire tricks sticking out. All right, in terms of capital letters, there are only two words I can think of, fart not being one of them, uh, <laughs> but, but tart likely, that this is the, just the tip edge of tart, which would have made sense because this particular area where, the, where he saw the fire truck was the theater district where prostitutes uh, worked the sidewalks. Yeah, you know, again, we don't, with no evidence, but, you know, well, you can see I'm. So, another challenge as we get close to the finale here, uh, uh, Franz Klein, I, I thought, well, I ought to take up the challenge of an abstract painting. What can you say? What kind of narrative? And one of the things I've always been intrigued, the tyranny of abstract expressionist criticism is all about form and shape and gesture, uh, et cetera. It's, it's all a kind of interior lingo. Uh, even Pollock's landscapes, I want to call our landscapes, they give a lavender mist, um, full fathom five. Klein called this the bridge. Now, it isn't, a, it isn't a, an image of a bridge, all those, all those central arch forms do to me look reminiscent of the Brooklyn Bridge. Klein spent a lot of time out in western Pennsylvania, northwestern Pennsylvania in coal mining country, uh, uh, interested in the railroads, uh, coal, steam. Uh, so I think these are about that industrial landscape, uh, the, the skyscrapers that were going up, uh, the freeform structures, uh, even uh, this circle with a cross in it is a form one sees along a railroad crossing for danger. So I think this is a kind of railroad crossing bridge, whether for automobiles or, uh, or railroad is, is indetermined. But it was a way, again, of talking about more than just form and shape and lingo. Edward Hopper, in terms of modern realism, was clearly, along with Andrew Wyeth, one of the great American uh, realist artists of the 20th century. Uh, as we know, Hopper painted countless figures, countless uh, houses, buildings, street scenes. This one always intrigued me, and I tried to dig into it uh, because, again, uh, the, for all of its realism, there's a certain mystery. What is going on here? Two gables side by side, uh, one with a seated uh, grandmother, uh, the other with the, the, the young woman in a bathing suit. Uh, are they related? Is it grandmother, daughter, grandmother, granddaughter? Uh, where are we? We have woods in the background, uh, a barely a hint of a road in the foreground. It's, it, it, we can't identify it as Gloucester or Provincetown. Uh, it's a kind of amalgam of, of a, a quasi-townscape, quasi-woodlandscape, all of which were subjects that intrigued Hopper, brought together here in this kind of amalgam. He called it second story sunlight. So he was fascinated, obviously, with the two stories, not only building stories, but personal histories. Uh, 
then, to your great relief, our, <laughs> our last parent. Uh, <coughs> I've mentioned my friendship over the years with Robert Indiana. I'd first met him as visiting artist when he came to Dartmouth, my first teaching job years ago. Got to know him then, kept up over the years, and became intrigued by his art. Ended up uh, in recent years, well, I guess I've worked on four Indiana exhibitions, written two or three books about him now. We became quite good friends. Uh, and I thought, uh, even though the journal discourages writing about living artists, this was a work from 1961, the very beginning of Indiana's career, when he simply hit the scene with a bang and did some of his classic early works. I also loved it because this was Indiana's, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, demonstrating his own love of American literature, the so-called American Renaissance. There is Indiana <coughs> coming from the Midwest to New York, getting a studio down on the water, lower waterfront on Conti's Slip, uh, where uh, he was aware Her Herman Melville had, a, had been a customs agent, where Walt Whitman had taken the Brooklyn Ferry back and forth and written Leaves of Grass. So Indiana sees himself, establishes himself now as an American artist in the tradition of the great literature, not only of New York, but of America, almost asserting he will, he will be their equal. And he did a series of these abstract kind of sign paintings, in this case, two circles, which have the lines from a Walt Whitman poem from, I think it's the 1857 edition of Leaves of Grass, uh, called Year of Meteors. And it's well documented that in the summer of 1857, uh, there were frequent meteor showers across the north, northeast and um, northern lights. And it became the subject of Whitman's poem uh, uh, in 57. And again, as Whitman turned it into a, hopefully a sign of optimism, this again done, for Whitman at least, the lines during the Civil War. Uh, so I, I, the more I looked at this picture, it seems terribly simple. It's an early picture when he was working with his friend and companion Ellsworth Kelly, who of course went on to be a totally abstract artist. And one of the reasons they separated, Kelly couldn't stand that Indiana insisted on words in his painting. But what I would point out here is that the, uh, that the blue and green of this painting uh, are Kelly's pictures. It's bound up, I'm sure, with their, early, with their early association. I also would like, you can tell me later, I'd like to read, as it were, the central circle as an island, Manhattan, with the, the blue projections as piers reaching out. You know, this is the opening sentence of Moby Dick, the island of Manhattos. Uh, and the, and, and uh, Mishmael goes down to the shorefront and then out onto his worldly, worldly voyage. So the symbol of the circle, the earth, et cetera, the cosmos, I think it is also bound, bound up here. And finally, uh, also a commission uh, in 2007, I th if I'm right, when Andy Wyeth died, again, an artist I'd known all my life, not all my life, but since the 60s, uh, and uh, had become very good friends. The one thing I learned from the Wyeths is that an artist tells you what he wants you to think, uh, and that, which is why until very recently I'd shied away from writing about living artists. Uh, they all talk back. They, 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 don't, tell you, they don't tell you the truth. Uh, and, uh, and yet everybody knew, uh, certainly by you know, the, the late 20th century, that Wyeth was one of the other, our other great realists. Well, of course, there are the obvious pictures that I immediately just, uh, decided I would not write about. As I say, the occasion was his death, and Gibson said, would I write a, a, um, an obituary? I said, no, I don't really want to write an obituary, but I will, will write a masterpiece. And so instead of choosing, of course, Christina's World or the turkey buzzards uh, soaring or any number of ones that you can think of and know, I chose this late work, which uh, belonged to the Wyeths themselves for years and uh, recently uh, now belongs to the Brandywine Museum. Uh, for years, they, they never uh, wanted it lent out. They were also very difficult about getting it reproduced. So it was not a, a well-known picture. It's a very large one almost the size of the screen. 
uh, a monumental, perfectly beautiful picture in terms of classic, I want to say, Andrew Wyeth, whites, grays, creams. It's just a symphony of, 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 of abstract lights and dorks. A uh, strange picture, of course, it's a maypole dance with a Christmas tree on top, maypole dancing at Christmas time. We're on the top of a great uh, uh, mound of a snow-covered hill, which is recognizable as uh, looking down on the Kerner Farm out in the Brandywine Valley, utterly familiar landscape to Wyeth. And I later got a chance to talk to him about it when he was, when, when he'd finished it, and he said, this is a painting uh, that, and it really was a kind of autobiography, I painted on my, for my 70th birthday. Uh, and so there are, as you see, seven fluttering ribbons, one for each decade of his career. And grouped around these, uh, the maypole, are several figures, all of whom you may be able to make out come from different decades of Wyeth paintings. On the left, for example, we have Carl and Anna Kerner, the Germans he knew in Brandywine. Next is Helga Testorf of the famous Helga series, uh, a guy named, a black uh, uh, farmhand named Will Loper with an artificial uh, uh, hand there. Uh, and then, um, I'm sorry, then comes Helga, uh, uh, Alan, uh, uh, Alan Lynch with his flapping um, uh, head headgear. These are all ident famous identifiable figures from uh, from Wyeth paintings. There's one addition, so you can make out then what one, two, three, four, five, six figures. Seven. Fi there aren't seven figures. There's one figure just obscured in the very middle background, where you see a coat flapped out. Uh, it could be any number of people. It could, first of all, be Betsy Wyeth, whom Andy painted uh, in, her, in her heavy coat with it, with it open like that years before in the Chad's Ford uh, courtyard. It could also be, I want to suggest, Wyeth himself. That's his autobiography, his art. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, uh, of course, the title called Snow Hill, again, is again all coded. Uh, he, he'd been, he and Betsy had been reading uh, Moby Dick, not surprisingly, and the last chapter is about, it's called Snow Hill, a great, about the great white whale. So Wyeth is playing with a lot of things in his own art, his own history here. Uh, we're looking down on the Kerner Forum in, in the background, but the one thing I would leave you with, if you count those ribbons one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one of them doesn't reach anybody's hand. So again, the whole question of who's missing and what, what's going on, this is of course the great genius uh, of why. That's more than enough. I think uh, this gives you some idea of the, of the what pleasure I had in writing these and finally pulling them together as a book. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> We're going to have a little reception, and yes, John is going to go directly up, so do not swarm him. He will be available to sign his book right up there. Get a glass of wine, have a little nibbly, and you can talk to him at the book sign. Thank you. Thanks, John.